Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. It's really wonderful to see you all here, and I'm so excited about this panel. I know a lot of you know me. My name is Seema Ahmad. I am uh, on the MPAC board, previously the chair of the MPAC board of directors. And um, my, my regular job, my, my other passion, is that I'm a federal public defender. Um, thank you. Oh, I love it. Give it up for the public defenders. Yeah. Any prosecutors in the audience today? No. OK. Just kidding. Um, so I am really thrilled to hear from this panel. Um, and I want to thank the MPAC staff, particularly Lori, for putting this together and all of her hard work. We have a full agenda for this panel because, as you all know, um, we are looking to sort of explore, analyze, and understand this kind of um, huge phenomenon of sort of racial superiority ideology and ethno-nationalism that has erupted both here and abroad. And so we have a perfect panel to do that. And the way I'm gonna try to sort of organize our discussion is we're gonna talk about some very heavy, serious domestic issues, the criminal justice system, immigration, and then we're also gonna try to touch upon some international issues like uh, Kashmir and Assam, the Rohingya, Palestine, and kind of then interweave them and talk about sort of the ideologies um, and the forces that are at play that cause so much human suffering and violence in sort of all these realms. Um, and so to do that, I'm gonna just mention who our panelists are, and then I'm gonna kick it off with specific questions for each of them. And of course, towards the end, um, we'll have audience questions as well. <clears throat> so um, our four panelists seated right next to me is uh, Dr. Yusuf Salam. He, he is um, a part of the Exonerated Five formerly known as the Central Park Five. How many of you have seen the recent film on the Central Park Five? So those of you who don't know, he's gonna explain it all, but he's gonna talk about his wrongful conviction, um, his experience with the criminal justice system, his ultimate exoneration, and we're very thrilled and honored to have you here today with us. Um, next to Dr. Salam is Dr. Julie Sierra. She's an internal medicine physician and associate professor of medicine at UCSD. She has been um, spending her, her free time and her expertise on giving um, free health care and medical treatment to a lot of the migrants who are um, in camps at the border. And so she's going to talk to us a little bit about her experience there and about what our um, immigrant population is experiencing. And then at the very end, we have Justin Conley, who's the Southern California uh, Senior Director for Human Rights Watch, with extensive knowledge about immigration policy, international issues, and obviously with all of the work that Human Rights Watch does, you know, he's, he's here to lend his expertise on these fundamental human rights issues that we see all over the world. So thank you for joining us, Justin. So as I mentioned, we have sort of a full agenda, but I want to start with domestically the criminal justice system. And so of course, um, Yusuf, I want to start with you. And maybe just to ground all of us who are not caught up, if you could talk to us about exactly your personal experience in the criminal justice system, what happened to you, how you came to be part of the exonerated five after previously the popular term was the Central Park Five, and if you could help everyone sort of understand and situate your experience. Absolutely. First, I would like to say salam alaikum to everybody in the room. It's definitely a pleasure of mine to be here and to join you today. My family would have been here, but they got tired after walking around Long Beach a little bit, taking in the sights, and so they're upstairs. Inshallah, they'll be able to re you know, come and uh, join us later on this evening. You know, this, this case, I remember um, 
when we were doing our appeal, in a country that is predominantly Christian, my attorney at the time was the late, great William Kunstler. And he came to me once and said, you know, Yusuf, these people want you so bad. We keep losing every appeal. It's, um, it's almost as if this case is such a case that Jesus Christ himself couldn't have won it. The case, however, has to be looked at under the revelation, if you will, of the Constitution of the United States. And so right there in the Constitution, we have something called the 13th Amendment, which clearly states that they can take you and turn you back into a slave for the punishment of a crime. Now, we look at this case and we understand that early on, we were bombarded as a public with over 400 articles being written about us. And for those of us who were on the other end fighting for our lives, it was a tsunami. We weren't supposed to survive that. Right in the midst of that tsunami, a man who would later become the President of the United States takes out an ad two weeks after we were accused. We hadn't gone to trial yet. We were accused. We were supposed to be looked at as innocent until proven guilty. But because of the color of our skin, we were looked at as guilty and had to prove ourselves innocent. This couldn't have been further defined until I was understanding why they were looking at me specifically with such hatred in their eyes while I went to trial and while I was waiting for the verdicts to come in. And to, to, be, to be frank, I think, they were looking at my future self. They were looking at this version of me that they wanted me not to become. And when you think about becoming, you have to put God in the mix. Because see, when God created us, God said be, and it is. And to be more direct, when our parents were, t were first conceiving of us, we each were one of over 400 million options and we were the ones that came out. And so that means that we were born on purpose. And not only were we born on purpose, but the fact that we were born on purpose means that we were born with a purpose. We have something that we are supposed to do. And I look at my life and, and all of the seemingly tragic events and really am grateful that I was chosen to be blessed to go through this trial and to survive, because it's an indication of what it is that we can do as a people. It's an indication also that really, truly, the criminal justice system, which has been known by me as the criminal system of injustice, when you look at this case really through a different lens, you almost see that God is placing this criminal system of injustice on trial, that, it, that God turned it on its side in order to produce a miracle in modern time. And it's a blessing that this story turned out the way it did. Because even when you think about every great story, the story cannot be that great unless there's a greater villain. So imagine that. 30 years later, the man who vilified us in the first place, who took out ads in New York City's newspapers specifically calling for the death penalty in our case, Wanting, wanting, hopefully, from someone from the darker enclaves of society to do to us what they had done to Emmett Till. And you can't really understand the depth of this here without understanding that as 14, 15, and 16-year-old children, we were afforded no protection under the law. They published our names. They published our phone numbers and our addresses in New York City's newspapers. As a matter of fact, after Donald Trump took out this ad, another man named Pat Buchanan almost went full lynch mob. He writes in the New York Post, why don't we just take the eldest one and hang him from a tree in Central Park, talking about Corey Wise. And why don't we take the others and strip them naked and horsewhip them? This is the type of justice that they were seeking 
from folks who were only accused. Fast forward, we were found to be innocent in 2002, late 2002, early 2003. And juxtaposed with the tsunami of media that really, um, I mean, it was there to kill us. We were supposed to have a social death if we even survive. You know, we weren't supposed to survive this. But, you know, when I think about, when I think about God in the context of this all, and what we call the predestination or the color of Allah, they say man plans and God plans, and God is the best of planners, you know. And so in 2002, 2003, which, by the way, is one of the most unlucky numbers in America, 13 years after we were accused of this crime, God saw fit to use that number to reveal that we didn't do it. It's extremely profound, Yusuf. Walk us through, if you can, just so we are all on the same page about the details of, if you don't mind, of what you and the others were accused of and how your exoneration came to be. Absolutely, so if anybody's seen the film, and if you, if you haven't, I, I definitely encourage you to watch it. Both the doc called The Central Park Five by Ken Burns, and also When They See Us by Ava DuVernay. We were in Central Park the night that this woman was raped, and we had nothing to do with it. And what's telling is that Raymond Santana and Kevin Richardson were arrested that night, and really we got, a, those of us that got arrested and were looked at, they arrested us because we were in Central Park after dusk. This is like, it's a law that says you cannot be in the park after a certain time. And so they were all gonna get desk appearance tickets. And then they found the jogger. And then they looked at us and said, really, we have to solve this case and solve it as quick as possible. We need to look at our constituents and make sure that their fears are arrested by them knowing that we found who did this. And that's the worst part about the criminal system of injustice. In that regard, what happens is that the people who really commit crime are actually out there committing more crime because they got the wrong people in the first place. And so they vilified us and made us into this phenomenon called the Central Park Five. It was a moniker that was placed on us, and of course, 30 years later, we happened to be on Oprah Winfrey show. Not the, not the real Oprah Winfrey show, but she was there, <laughs> and we were, we were enjoying ourselves, and she, she said to us, and she said to the audience, we should have them rebranded. They should no longer be known as the Central Park Five, but they must now be known as the Exonerated Five. Yeah. And the worst part was that we were vilified. Our families were vilified. The full spike wheels of justice mowed us down. And the tragedy of this case is not just that the woman was raped, but that she believed that we were the ones who did it. Even 13 years later when the truth came out, the theory that the system brought forth was that this was the sixth man. And that's the worst part about it too. You want the system to work, and I think the system works in some ways, but I want people to know very, very specifically and very clearly the Central Park Jogger case is not an anomaly. The Central Park Jogger case is not, you know, we got this one wrong and, you know, we, we, usually make, we usually get it right. When we look at what's happening, not only with the innocence projects of the, of the nation, but also when we look at what's happening on social media and we look at what's happening, you know, just in our, in our communities, we quickly, and under, we quickly find out that we live in two Americas, separate and unequal divided and ununified. And I think it's our job as citizens who care and as global presence to try to bring that to the front so that we can finally have one global perspective of what America is about. 
Thank you, Yusuf. I'm gonna come back to your experience in a minute. I wanna bring Justin into the conversation. I know there's some themes that sort of underpin our long history of how we deal with immigration and migrants, and I'm wondering if you can sort of situate us. A lot of us know about child separation at the border. That was a huge sort of public outcry issue, but I want you to talk to us about what's sort of happening with the mig migrant population right now um, under Trump and in the, current, in the current era. Terrific, thank you. And uh, thank you all for being here and MPAC for having me. Um, so the, the uh, immigration system, uh, there's basically three ways people come into this country. So raise your hand if you came in with like documents and an invitation and a family here and you came in uh, fully documented. So you have tons of people who come in that way. Then there's a whole other group of people that used to come in around 100,000 people a year uh, and those are asylum seekers. People who are fleeing violence, who are going to get killed if they return. Had they come through, they take uh, you know, a year, 18 months, and those are the asylum seekers. Who here came as a refugee or asylum seeker? This is uh, another way of coming into the United States, to go through that whole UN asylum program. And then there are a whole group of people who come in uh, undocumented over the border. And in the current political environment, I won't ask anybody to raise her hand if you came that way. <laughs> Uh, so those are the three ways. Uh, and over our history, you know, the numbers on each side have gone up, they've gone down. There's been some sense sometimes, there's been some nonsense sometimes. Uh, but if we look at the current regime we're under, uh, we have a situation where, uh, um, actually dating back a little while, the asylum process became kind of difficult, where people who came for asylum, instead of having an interview and basically being released on parole, started being detained. And this is something that happened in the Obama administration as a way of a political deal where we'll get tough on the border, but then we'll uh, get the dreamers through. They didn't get the dreamers through, but they forgot to stop being tough on the border. And then, you know, be, beware of the systems you put in place because you don't know what's coming down the pike. You have all these detention centers, and now you have Donald Trump. And now we're in a completely different regime and a system that was, uh, you know, through our entire history plagued with, you know, racism of one kind, suddenly it's just in your face and it is, you know, people coming here are rapists and murderers and, uh, and we don't want them. When in fact, of course we want them. Of course this whole country for, you know, our whole history is, the reason our country is so successful is because we keep regenerating ourselves through immigration. Uh, but it stopped. So now we have 18,000 uh, asylum seekers allowed. So that's, you know, not even doing one drop in the bucket for the worldwide asylum prob uh, refugee problem. We have, uh, uh, you know, a massive cut down, especially from specific countries, uh, on l documented immigration. Um, and that is starving all kinds of industries uh, and causing real concern across business and labor. And then the situation with, uh, with people who are coming undocumented is also incredibly difficult. Um, mass deportations of people who've been here for, you know, their, most of their lives, uh, people who are, and then, so that's the, the pressure on people who are here, and then kind of, which you can speak to, uh, sadly and uh, just incomprehensibly to pretty much all of us, except for the people who like it, this just politics of cruelty at the border. You know, if we make it so bad People would rather stay in Guatemala and lose their kid to a gang than face Ciudad Juarez, you know? And that, I mean, I don't even know what to say about it, honestly. You know, kids taken away from the border, people have filed for asylum instead of coming in, they're sent back, they're turned away. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know, criminal gangs on the borders, the southern border of Mexico, with uh, Guatemala, the northern border of Mexico with us, uh, it's just a complete mess. And it is a complete, manufactured, man-made, policy-driven mess. 
you've seen the pictures, you know what it looks like, and we find ourselves now where, how do we go forward with the craziness? You can maybe give a, a situation of what your experience has been. Yeah, Julia, if you could talk about sort of what these policies mean on the ground with the people that you've worked on, and if both of you actually could, I think, articulate in a little bit more detail what you mean when you say it's a manufactured mess, just, just so we can kind of get into it a little bit more. So I have been working in Tijuana as well as San Diego for the last year, um, taking care of primarily people from the refugee caravans. Um, we have medical teams that go out to Tijuana shelters every Saturday, and we take care of anybody that needs uh, assistance. We see some pretty bad conditions. Um, I'm sure you all saw the pictures when the caravan first arrived in October, there was a huge encampment and, and then it got flooded and they got moved to another place and that has all been dispersed and now there's thought to be a, at least 30 different shelters where people are staying. Uh, three or four of them are specifically for LGBTQ populations. Um, we see a lot of kids, we see horrible conditions. People are sleeping on the floor, they're sleeping on dirt floors, they're, they don't have enough food, they don't have access to basic sanitation. Um, we see a lot of upper respiratory infections that we take care of, um, but mostly what we see is people who are just traumatized by what they've been through in their home countries, and they're fleeing violence only to be put into a situation where their lives are now at risk from other causes. You know, Tijuana is not a safe place, especially at night, and there have been multiple people killed um, from these caravans. Um, and then on the San Diego side, what we see is people who have spent five days in detention with ICE or uh, CBP, Customs and Border Patrol, and I've seen people that I've known in Tijuana, and then I see them on the other side in just five days in those detention centers, and they look like a different person. That, that you just look into their eyes and their, what they've been through, especially the children, they're just traumatized, re-traumatized. And now with the uh, migrant protection policy that we have in place, now everyone's being made to wait in Mexico. Technically, if you're seeking asylum, you're supposed to be allowed to come into this country and wait for your, your trial date, but because of our current president and his administration, people are being made to wait in Mexico. So the shelters are even more crowded. Um, and the situation just keeps getting worse. So, you know, like we were just saying, it's a totally manufactured crisis. It doesn't have to be this way. People, um, the majority of people that are coming actually have family in the United States that are willing to accept them and willing, they're waiting for them to come to their, to their house, wherever they are in the country. Um, we have a whole network of people in San Diego that are helping, um, but it's, it's, it's overwhelming and it's, it's so infuriating to know that these are people who have committed no crime, and yet when they're released from custody by our government agencies, they're in shackles, they're in handcuffs, they're dropped on the street in San Ysidro and told, welcome to America, as they undo their shackles. So the way that people are being treated is absolutely inhuman. Do you have anything else on that, Justin? Just vote in November, <laughs> 2020, that's the answer. So now that we've sort of out- well, You know, we should, to put this in the larger context, and maybe I'm beating a dead horse, you know, this, since this is about ethno-nationalism, you know, you kind of remember that quote, and I wish I looked it up before to remember who it is, but kind of a cynical thing, you know, a third of the country is willing to stand silent while another third kills the other third. <laughs> you know, so it's a real, uh, and that only happens when the politicians, when, 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 when somebody in charge kind of stirs people up to make it happen. And I think that's a moment that we're living in the United States right now where people are really, where some politicians are doing everything they can to stir up sentiment against, to divide people so they can hold on to their power. And it's the oldest, most cynical play in the playbook, you know? I mean, there's a tiny group of people who actually believe this stuff, but there's another group of people who exploit it to, to their advantage. And, uh, I, and I never thought we'd see it in this kind of way here. We see it in other ways, but in this particular kind of way. And uh, you know, we thought we'd passed it. You know, they thought that we'd moved past it, and we haven't. So uh, that's a um, 
Yeah, that's a great segue for a question I have for you, Yusuf. Um, I would say that I'm guilty of this. A lot of us are guilty of feeling like this moment that we are in in American history is something that we couldn't have ever have imagined or wouldn't have thought could ever have happened. But the reality is you were arrested in what year? 1989. And you were exonerated in 2002. 2002, 2003. Right. So... And it's not like people aren't still getting arrested. Right. 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 But your story predates Trump. It predates, you know, it's a... And so, so the question I have for you is, it's kind of a funny question in a way, but why do you think this happened to you? What are the forces at play? Was it racist prosecutors? Was it, you know, unbiased discrimination? Was it structural issues? Why did a young kid who had no business spending, you spent seven years in prison, who had no business spending seven years in prison, why did this country eat you up and then chew you out? So I just want to maybe add a fourth dynamic to the people who've come to this country. And that fourth dynamic is that we were enslaved, brought from other places and placed in this country unwillingly. And the best, the best of us went through that process, the transatlantic slave trade. And I say that in particular as I, as I begin to answer your question because when I think about what happened to me, I think about white supremacy, white male dominance. I think about those individuals who were walking around, and we all saw them on social media and on the news, and they kept saying states' rights as they had their tiki torches lit. States' rights, states' rights. And it's states' rights to what? Because the whole statement is not states' rights. The whole statement is states' rights to own slaves or own people. And it begins to take shape and become more clear as I said before, as we look at the 13th Amendment. Because anybody can read that document. Anybody looks at the Constitution and says, oh wow, in the, in, right in here we have the 13th Amendment that clearly states that we can take you and turn you into a slave if you are punished and convicted of a crime. That'd be fine. However, that language that we look at is talking about a specific group of people. The overwhelming landscape in the American criminal justice system is black and brown. When I got there and I spent five years in the youth facility, I graduated into the adult facility and they gave me a number. And if we know anything about prison, every day, maybe five times a day, you have to get on the gate or on the count. The police are coming down the corridor and they are making a count of all the people that are there. You have to say your name and your number. You could be doing anything. You could be using the bathroom. You have to get up physically make yourself present, and then you can go back to doing what you were doing. My number that they gave me was 95A1113. I'll never forget this number, because when I found out the significance of this number, it, it painted a picture that I wasn't yet ready to digest. In 1995, I got sent to the big house. It's either B, A, B, or R. A is the first half of the year, B, second half, R, you became a product of recidivism. You left and you came back. This is where it's telling. My position in line was that I was the 1,000th, 113th person to enter the door, and my birthday's in February. So from January 1st to February 27th, I was the 1,000th, 113th person to enter the door. We're talking about a system which allows for the, 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 what we know or what we knew as slavery and has morphed into this new Jim Crow. We look at things and we can truly understand it when we follow the money. Because why would they prefer to have a person occupy a jail cell as opposed to occupying a classroom dorm room. You know, you can, you, can, you can pay for people to get educated and it will cost less than you paying to house a young person in a prison industrial complex. But yet, this is the American way. 
And I say that because when you look at the inception of where and how this country was created, it was built on slave labor. And they don't have a problem with continuing that reality. There are a lot of prisons that are right now that are on the stock market. There are a lot of prisons that right now are privatized. There are a lot of prisons right now. I have an article in my, my bag of tricks that uh, it's, a, it's about a, a, a judge who was busted for taking bribes under the table to send white children to jail. And so the important, and the, the, the important part about that is, wow, he got busted because he was sending white children to jail. Imagine how many other judges have not gotten busted or other people that have not gotten busted who are making sure that these prisons continue to remain full in these other municipalities. And so it's telling too, because once you realize that when the, system, when the census rolls down the hill and they are counting those inmates as part of that location as, a part of, as opposed to where they really came from, it's all about follow the money. What happened to us was nothing new. I remember, and I, I mentioned Emmett Till before, but I remember when I first became aware of Emmett Till, I was watching what they call the untold story of Emmett Till. A friend of mine was creating this documentary, and she wanted to be able to reveal these salient points that happened. And the camera was rolling while the trial was going on against the people who murdered Emmett Till. They did a criminal act, but the people who were on the jury, when they got the, when they got the case and they began to deliberate, the cameras were still rolling on them. They got the case, they deliberated, they took a break, they came back, and then they voted not guilty for the individuals who were accused and who had murdered Emmett Till. The cameras were still rolling, and one of the jurors was asked, what took you so long to come back with a verdict of not guilty? And they said, well, we wanted to take a soda pop break because we didn't want to come back with a verdict of guilty, I mean, not, I mean, not guilty, too fast, even though we knew we were going to vote not guilty. But we didn't want to come back too quickly with a verdict of not guilty. We wanted to appear to do our job. So it's all about optics. And the Central Park Jogger case, I think, is a very, very glaring and great example because it shows things that they couldn't contend with, right? I mentioned the hand of God in the midst of this, this whole thing. And imagine my surprise when I, while I'm in prison, six months into my prison bid, an officer walks up to me, and he, his name is Jerome Jones. He walks up to me and he says, hey, young brother, who are you? And in my confusion, what I, what I said to him was, I'm Yusuf Salam, one of the guys that they accused of raping a Central Park jogger, but I didn't do it. And I was surprised that he said, I know that. I've been watching you. You're not supposed to be here. Why are you here? Who are you? This set my whole life on a new trajectory I started to try to find out, you know, what the meaning of my name was, and I mean, just all kinds of things, just to make sense of this thing that I had been faced with. And I found out that Yusuf, which is my first name, means God will increase. My whole name is Yusuf Idris Fadl Abdus Salam. And I found out that Yusuf means God will increase, that Idris means the teacher, that Fadl is with justice, and Everyone knows that Salam is peace. But I'm in prison finding out for the first time that my parents named me. God will increase the teacher with justice and peace. I knew that there was a lot of things and work that I needed to do. And I knew that I was being called to do something specifically. Because even after we were found to be innocent and we were exonerated in 2002, 2003, it took another 12 years for them to even make any movement regarding our lawsuits. Another 12 years. They were hoping that the accident of time would happen to us. And this is the way it's always been. As we look at these things and we peel it back, who is in charge of these policies? 
white supremacy, white male dominance. Why won't they allow folks to come in? White supremacy, white male dominance. You're talking about people who you, you said to yourself, you said you saw people five days before and five days later in, in, in the word in Arabic is majnoon. You look, they completely are crazy. They, they are so unimaginably changed and altered by what they have faced. I have small children myself. Imagine a child being without the protection and the care of their parents for one hour, for a few minutes. We as parents who care, we're concerned. We go into a mall and you know, Johnny runs off or somebody, we're like, oh my goodness, you know, we want to put out an APB. Now you have a government who is separating and saying, no, you got to be here, you got to be there. These are their children. You're creating a condition that is so tragic. The, you know, the, this, this should be looked at in the courts of the human rights as to what's going on in America and what's been going on in America. For all three of you, you know, one of the questions that I have is, if you were to go door by door and talk to people about human rights and whether they believe in human rights, I would think that most people would say yes. Do you support human dignity? Do you support life? Do you support families, children? What is it about what's happening in the country right now that's allowing just this mass scale or perpetuation of dehumanization of others? And Justin, maybe you don't agree that most people would support human rights. Let me say, would most people support human dignity? I mean, if like the answer it's in is their no, list of things that are important. I guess if the you know, answer is <laughs> what they're having for breakfast seems to trump everything. If the answer is yes, they do support human dignity. The question is, how are we where we are? If the answer is no, most people don't. Then the question is, where do you go from there mm. as a starting point? So I have a question for you. Either way. <laughs> so. Um, so. So when you dedicate your life to human rights, you become very aware of ways in which people do not dedicate their lives to human rights. And you're not just the people who are, you know, wicked, but people going through their daily lives. And you come to understand that there are a couple forces at play. Uh, one of them is, I mean, life is hard. Like, you just, you gotta get up, you gotta go to work, you, gotta, you have all these things that you have to do, and if you have to wrap your brain around what's happening in China or what's happening at the border or what's happening, uh, you, it's, it's too much. And so just a lot of people are just focused on what they're doing because it all just seems too much. And so if I had to say anything, I would say, you know, resist that urge or find ways to express your compassion. You know, voting is certainly one of them. But, you know, if you, um, you know, when you see a homeless person, do you turn away and think, God, why doesn't somebody get rid of that person? Or do you open your heart a little bit and understand that they're not doing it just to piss you off, you know? Um, so that's, that's sort of one group of people. And then when you start getting into kind of government and policy situations, you know, then suddenly it's like, would we rather have human rights or development? Would we rather have human rights or security? And if you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet, well, that's just the way it goes. And that is also something that is a, those are fake deals. They are fake fake, fake, fake propositions. Because when you abandon human rights in favor of security, before you know it, nobody has rights, and then nobody has security. <laughs> when you abandon human rights for development, you start getting some, ty some tyrant who starts stealing everything for himself, and then the development falls apart, and then you have a cataclysm that takes everybody back 
five steps before what they had before, Syria being a good example. And so these, another thing, I just encourage everybody to resist wherever they see it, you know? People say, hey man, China's a miracle. They, they know what they're doing, they've raised everybody out of poverty, they've, it's been, and you know what, that is absolutely true. It's amazing, it's amazing that people are eating who didn't used to eat, it's amazing that people are, but to the degree that the, you know, the president of China and his cronies say, and that's because we are so great, and because us, small little group, have managed to figure everything out, so why don't you just cede all of your liberty to us, and we'll take care of you. Well, you know what, that's wrong. And so you can be in favor of, you know, development, but you don't have to be in favor of, you know, tyrants who justify their actions because of that development. I'll stop there. Those are two things. Um, I think I come across probably three different kinds of people when I'm trying to recruit to help us out at the border. Um, there's probably more than three, but we, we, I have a lot of friends who are, you know, they're, I think everybody is against what's happening, or most people are against it, but a lot of people are just trying to survive themselves. They're living pay, paycheck to paycheck, and they're like, I'm just trying to feed my own kids and take care of my own family. The second group is people who care, but not enough to be inconvenienced. And I think that's a big portion of people, um, white people in particular, I find, like people that I'm trying to recruit, I, I say, you know, like, we need help. We have all these children being put into detention centers, they're being put into cages, they're being treated like animals. And sometimes I wonder, like, if these were a bunch of little white blonde kids, mm. how differently would people react? Um, and then there's people, I think, that really want to help, but they don't know how. You know, like when I was first trying to figure this all out, I, I literally live four miles from the border. And I was like, how do I help? I was trying to get into the detention centers. They won't let any, any of us in. I happened to be speaking at a rally with somebody else who was trying to get doctors to go to Tijuana. Um, and the, the horrible thing is that, you know, what we see on the news every day is just, it just makes you want to give up sometimes. Um, but, there are so many people down in San Diego that are stepping up and really helping and people who work full time. I work full time. I have a lot of friends who, um, you know, on Saturday they're taking people to the airport, putting them on planes, making sure they get fed. There's a whole network of people, white, black, brown, Asian, Native American, like everybody's stepping up and, and working together to help and it kind of is, it's like, okay, the world isn't an awful place. I mean, it is, but like it's, it's for this moment, it's not as bad as we think it is. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the theme that we're sort of talking about is like empathy and how you, like when you talk about the, if it was a bunch of little white girls and with blonde hair, and what would the empathetic response be in that case versus brown and black children? Um, and so it, it sort of dovetails into a question I wanna go back to about the domestic criminal justice system, which is probably the number one question that I get asked when people find out what I do is how do you represent people that are guilty of crimes? How can you represent someone who's done something um, against the law? And so, you know, Yusuf, uh, in a lot of ways, you can be this wonderful poster child in a sense, not to use a, a, a sort of denigrating term, but you know, because you were innocent. You were innocent. So the question that I have is, what do you say to someone who says, yeah, that, that white hegemonic ideology, that racial superiority, I'm totally with you, it was there at slavery. I'm totally with you, it was there at Jim Crow. I'm totally with you that it was part of why you were wrongfully imprisoned, but what about those thousands and thousands of people in this country that are incarcerated, that are brown and black, but that committed crimes? Um, and that sometimes the connection of sort of why this is all happening, that becomes a blockage or a blockage when you talk about, well, we can't just open the borders and we can't just let everyone in. So I want to kind of dig into some of those more difficult questions about that blockage that may be there if, if the 
if the hypothesis of this panel or the theory of this panel is in part that there is a dangerous racial um, nationalistic ideology at play, how do you then tackle those types of arguments? So thank you for that question because when I, when I think about specifically with regards to the criminal justice system is when it comes to folks who have found themselves committing crime, I look at what conditions provided them the opportunity to commit that crime. And I say specifically like things like redlining, things like manufactured poverty. What do you mean by redlining, Yusuf? So, you know, when you take a situation and you say, you know what, we're gonna disallow a whole proportionate number of people the opportunity to make something of themselves. And then we're going to 100% allow another group of folks to make something of themselves by giving them government opportunities to buy homes and leverage their, their homes against other things and things of that nature. You have people who have always been given lemons in life and then they make lemonade. You got people who, for, for example, maybe some of the biggest drug dealers in America and then you have Oliver North. No guns are being manufactured in our backyards. No poppy seeds in our backyards being grown, no cocoa leaves, none of that stuff is there. But somehow it's, it's, it's here and it's in this country. And when you go after drugs in the late 70s, the early 80s, it becomes a war on drugs. And then when you go after drugs in modern times, today, it becomes an, an epidemic, an opioid epidemic. We need to open up the Betty Ford clinics of the world and help people to get their lives back because they're, they're, you know, this addiction thing is real. You know, I look at all of that stuff and even in criminology, like even in folks who are saying, I want to be the bad man, there's, there's like, there's love, there's desire, there's, wow. There's conditions that created that. When you have a people who have been able to rise on the backs of power in that context, that's a problem. Because then you got other folks who are literally planning out things in such a way that no one in my community or other communities that I've spoken at when I ask this question, who can raise their hand? Who has physically planned their life and decided that they want to be dead or in jail before they reach the age of 21? I never get any takers. But somehow this, is a, this, this mental makeup is accepted in our communities. And it's almost like, well, we just expect that. That's, that's an expectation that you're going to be dead or in jail before you reach. I mean, I was 15 when I got locked up, you know? And I mean, the, the, there, are, there are other issues that go with that. And one of the other things that I, I think about in a more profound way is that you got man who is creating law and you got God who is creating law and you got law which states slavery was legal at one moment in time. These are huge problems. And, and, and just to get back in terms of the whole idea of a criminal justice system, it used to be that if you did a crime, you then paid your price and you were allowed to reacclimate back into society. We no longer have that reality in the criminal justice system, which is why I call it the criminal system of injustice for a whole host of other reasons. But when we look at it from those vantage points, we can't, we can't talk about people who are trying to make a way out of no way without the conditions that created those things in the first place. We're in a country right now where we can absolutely, and I wanna, say, I wanna dare say we are in a world right now where we can absolutely cure most of the ills that we find ourselves in the world. 
But for some reason, some folks say, well, it's okay for that person to starve. While not only do I eat, but when I order my meal, I have a whole lot of leftovers because of gluttony, because of greed, because of just because I can. We know that there's policy work to be done, of course, and we know that there's reform to be done. But on this issue of sort of the ideology behind all of it, what is it that we need to do? What is it that we need to do to take down white supremacy? What is it that we need to do to fight back against this ideology that feels like it's taken more of a hold than ever domestically? And we haven't really been able to touch on it because there's so much to talk about, but internationally, that it's just sort of like sprouting multiple heads in so many lo locations, talked about China, Kashmir, Palestine. Um, so your um, advice for all of us, a simple question really, <laughs> which is how do, we, how do we tackle this? And then audience, you guys can get ready for your questions as well. So I just wanna, I just wanna say this real quick. Even though I recognize white supremacy, white male dominance as the problem, the elephant in the room, when it comes to the unification of, as a, the unification of us as a people, the true battle is not racial. It appears to be that way. But the true battle is battling spiritual wickedness in high and low places. That's when you really understand what's really going on. Because when I go into the audiences that I speak and I look out, they represent the kaleidoscope of the human family. Everybody is there that wants to make sure that we walk into the world and we move into the future with true freedom, justice, and equality for all, not for some. And so dismantling it, I think, folks always have asked the question, you know, is this, is this a problem where the system is broken and needs to be fixed? And I submit that the system is working fine. It is actually working exactly as it was designed to work. The policies that have been in place are exactly there to, and, and those of us who care are outraged. And so on the one hand, for those of us who are outraged, who are able to, as we join the system, we have to join the system with full awareness and become the spooks who sat by the door. We can't go in there and say, man, this is a great job. I'm about to get a paycheck. We got to understand that we, we, if we were called to this, then it's about working from the inside out as we work from the outside in to change the conditions of our people. Because God says he will not change the conditions of us until we change the conditions of ourselves. And we have to move in that reality because everything that's being presented to us, it, it literally falls away when we are on our deathbed. Because now we know what's really at stake. Now we know what we should have been doing in the world, how much of it we should have been doing, where our focus should have lied. We're not thinking, man, I should have, man, I should have stayed in a, in a job five more hours. And no, we're thinking about stuff that really matters because we're about to meet our maker. You know, a friend of mine, Les Brown, he said, one of the worst positions to be in is on your deathbed. And instead of having your friends and family praying for you as you cross over, but imagine all of the hopes, all of the dreams, all of the aspirations that you, that came to you. Imagine their ghosts looking at you, knowing that they're going to die with you because you were the only one that could give it life. And so now the most wealthy place is not in, you know, the Middle East where there's gold, or, I mean, where there's oil or, the, or in Africa where there's diamonds and, and gold, but it's truly in the, in the graveyard where people's hopes and dreams and aspirations have gone to die. And it's not until the end that we really understand what's important. Because like I say to people all the time, we're supposed to be hustling for the dash in between our birth and our death. That's what matters. When we think about how people are building their careers off of the backs of even the so-called Central Park Five, as we were once known. 
and they called it politics. All of those people who have built their careers off of our backs, those things are crumbling. And if they've already left this earth, they've left a terrible legacy for their children in the families that they come from. Thank you, Yusuf. I think we've got to audience questions now. I'm sorry? Audience questions now. Oh, yeah. Well, OK. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I accept that. Thank you so much to all three of you. Um, Dr. Salam, I watched the show after the When They See Us with Oprah, and that's where I was just blown away that there was accountability for some of the people who had a hand in injustice. So for those of us in LA, we don't get the media in New York to follow this, but after the show aired, so here it is, what, how many years later, and um, where the prosecutor and I think the sex crimes person, they both lost their positions on boards and their fancy lectureship at famous universities. And so that, for me, was just accountability for people who had a hand in, ju in injustice. So I just wanted to share that and, and thank you for being here. And also, I guess, ask your fellow panelists, um, where, where, where can we get accountability for some of those, like, for example, at the border, the border guards who maybe in their heart know what they're doing is wrong, uh, recently, there was an editorial in the Times of somebody who is a lawyer who just finally said, I've had enough of this, and quit his job as an amnesty officer. We need more stories like that of people who do the right thing or who refuse to do the wrong thing, and then for those who continue to have accountability. And same for the China, those people who are, um, I mean, some of their relatives are here in this country studying, uh, or, you know, they sent their kids here, and yet they're um, dealing with these re-education camps for the Muslims in China. So accountability, I, I would like to see how you can address that, please. We're actually in the midst of filing a lawsuit against ICE for, uh, actually against Customs and Border Patrol um, on behalf of an 18-year-old young man who was taken into custody and had his antibiotics taken away. Um, he had an ear infection and within five days he became really ill so they released him and did nothing to help him and he ended up having, uh, the infection had spread to his mastoid bone and he had to have his entire mastoid bone removed. He was in the hospital at UCSD for two weeks. Um, he had a clot in his internal jugular so now he's on blood thinners. Um, all of which could have been prevented by just letting the kid take his antibiotics. And this is not anything unusual. Um, they take away people's medications all the time. We see it every day. Um, and we need, you know, it, you need to stand up. You know, it's, it's easy to say, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening, this is horrible. There's so many ways to get involved and there's so many things you can do. Even if it's donating to one of these foundations that's working with people at the border, money helps. You know, people are spending 18 hour days trying to help people just survive down there. So um, there's always something you can do. And the first thing is to just really educate yourself about what's going on. You know, I, what I want to say, too, um, in terms of that, that what you just said about that young man or that young person, um, it, re it reminds me of on a, on a different scale and in a different way the creation in terms of experimentation on a people, right? Of things like the projects. And they call it the projects, but really it's a coded word to talk about experimenting on a people and just sitting back to see what they do. And here you had a person who clearly needed something and you denied them for what? Those of us who, who are concerned I say to them that we have to live our lives without fear. When we understand what fear is, which is an acronym which stands for false evidence appearing real, we realize that as soon as we assert ourselves, they say the devil's a liar. And so that true wickedness begins to run and hide. And then what we need to do is we need to stay on our dean, so to speak, and seek out others who are about that life, who know that whatever hits us will never miss us. And whatever misses us, we can never avoid. So we don't have to live in fear. We could be bold in our presenting and in our lives as long as we know that we are on the side of right. 
And that comes in, in, in terms of all of the stuff that we're talking about. Folks know that if we lend our money, some people say, well, I don't have the money to lend. But the reality is that when you put something over here, there's something spiritual that happens over there. And that's something that we have to acknowledge as well. Thank you, Yusuf. Yes. Um, so I can thank you. My name is Fayaz Hussein, and I've been a practicing lawyer for 19 years, and I never read the 13th Amendment like you did, so thanks for teaching me this. I pulled out my pocket constitution. <laughs> do you carry a constitution with you I wherever do, I you do. go? In case I get stopped <laughs> at the border, great. my last name is Hussein, so I, I literally have it every single minute. I should have the Quran as well, but I'll do that too. But, uh, <laughs> my bad. Uh, but it does say, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment shall exist. So in law school, we just blew past it saying it, it banned the slavery, but it, it hasn't. It's shocking uh, and real. Um, what's interesting is um, I also learned, and I, you're a federal defender, one of the practical things I learned in law school from a professor of mine was, look, if you want to change the system, it's great to become a defender, but you should put like defender but you might have a lot of influence as a prosecutor because you may not be able to bring charges that are unjust, if you will. Um, and so one practical piece of advice I give to people, like I'm in a safe state, Illinois, you're in California, um, is send money to, to states that matter. Trump won with less than 75,000 votes in three states, and that changed the system to where we are now today. So I'd love to get some practical advice from you on what we could be doing. Um, and you've been, all given great advice already and phenomenal words. Uh, but anything else people should be doing in safe districts uh, to, to, to turn the tide. Otherwise, I worry the Republicans are masters of deceit. We know that this will head another uh, four years. We won't mm. know what we look like um, if this goes on for another four or five years. So other things you could do would be great to tell us. Please. So any thoughts on that and sort of related um, Maybe, uh, Yusuf, you can just talk about your criminal justice reform efforts as well. So what I will say is that, you know, in terms of the, the voting process, I don't think ever in history has there ever been a time where the, the total consensus of people who vote, or who can vote, rather, has voted. You know, and I think that that's something that we need to look at, because when we talk about what we can do, you know, we've already heard we have to vote, and we have to vote. We have to make sure that we do all that we can do. Part of the, the interesting problem is the block of folks who have been disenfranchised, who are able now to become part of the franchise again. I think that we need to educate them in a very, very powerful and strong way to let them understand that if you do not vote, you have just participated in the problem. Because non-participation is participation. And so even if we look at the overwhelming majority of us who can vote, part of what we need to look at too is how do we change the, the ease of use so that everybody can vote who wants to vote? In a similar way, we have to file taxes, and they do it through the internet and all of this other stuff. But yet, when we go to our voting booths and polls sometimes, they say that they, the, uh, we're sorry. Um, they got the wrong plugs to plug in the power so that you can utilize these machines. Or they tell other folks, listen, I know you came here um, maybe 20, 50 miles, uh, but you came to the wrong site. Your site is 20, 50 miles in the opposite direction. These folks don't have the luxury sometimes of being able to take off from their jobs. You know, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tragic situation, but we have to seek out ways. I think that, I think that if we look at America in the context of the, of the youthfulness of America, America is a very young nation. And in the youthfulness of its nation, we probably can push things more faster into the proper future that we want to, as long as we understand that our unity is more powerful than an atomic bomb. As soon as we unify, it's all over. Game over. <laughs> Thank you, Yusuf. One last question, and then we're going to close out the, the panel. I would like to thank from the panel. Thank you very much. Very informative information. Uh, my question is that, let's take a little bit smaller step here. 
One of the, my major problem is, or major concern is, in our school that there's a bullies. These bullies traumatize in all the kids for years to come, and the kid cannot take that to their parents or tell anybody else, but they carry on for a long time, and that's gonna affect them when they grow up, and that, dr that dramatic experience they have, they're gonna haunt them for the rest of their life. And is there anything we can do? What can we do as a nation? What can, what can be done? Not only the Muslim uh, with the hijab in the school get uh, ostracized, Anybody else, if somebody is fat, somebody is skinny, somebody long, that bullying in the school has to stop because that affects a lot of our children and a lot of our people in the society. I mean, I, I can take a stab at it real quick. There is no barrier between the oppressed when they raise their hands to their Lord. And I mean, it, 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 sometimes it seems like hocus pocus but when you think about, we can't even see the air we're breathing right now. Imagine a person having that much conviction. We have to speak out because fear, fear will cause a person to even go beyond something like bullying. Let's say we're talking about mo child molestation or something like that. You know, this child continues down the path of being molested because they're being told by their molester if you say something, I'm gonna kill your whole family. They not killing nobody. Say something, speak up. Seek out those who can definitely come to your aid. Because the reality of the matter is that we all know that as soon as you reveal light in darkness, it vanishes. And we have to move in that power. We can't be afraid and our children, a lot of our children are afraid. A lot of them think that this false evidence that they see in front of them is real, but once they step up for themselves, they'll, they, will, they will see that it was a fleeting thing and that really the bully is the one that's afraid. Closing note I wanna say is, you know, even though we really tackle some very, very heavy, difficult topics, I have to say that one of the things I love about the Muslim Public Affairs Council and why, you know, I just, feel that MPAC is in my blood is because there's a way in which, and Yusuf, you said it better than anyone else could, there's a way in which, to me, MPAC blends this perfect marriage of spirituality and social justice and action. And so for me, although, <laughs> give it up for MPAC. So for me, what I'm left with is we get to use our spirituality and our commitment to this community to do something about all of these things we talked about and that we're not just passive um, victims. And I appreciate each of you on the panel for making that message clear to all of us today and for sharing your incredible wisdom. Thank you so much. <laughs>